Hello there, my name is Parth, and today I briefly want to talk to you about particle physics, which is the study of all the little particles that make up all of the stuff around us. Specifically, I want to discuss two processes and talk about what they have in common, despite looking quite different on the surface. This will also bring us to the idea that antiparticles are just particles going backwards in time. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So first things first, let's take a look at the two processes that we'll be focusing on in this video. Both of these processes involve very few particles, specifically an electron and a photon, as well as their respective antiparticles, a positron and a photon because a photon is its own antiparticle. We'll look at what we mean by antiparticles shortly, but first let's consider a photon, that's a particle corresponding to electromagnetic waves. In other words, it's the particle form of light. Now, photons always travel at the same speed through a vacuum. They travel at the speed of light, but they can have different wavelengths. Well, technically, the electromagnetic wave that corresponds to these photons has a particular wavelength, and this wavelength directly relates to how much energy each photon carries. A longer wavelength photon carries less energy than a shorter wavelength photon. Anyway, so this photon that we're talking about is traveling, let's say, in this direction, and it interacts with this electron that we initially saw to be stationary. The electron and photon interact in a surprisingly similar way to two pool balls colliding with each other, because we can use conservation of energy and conservation of momentum to work out how much of the photon's energy is transferred to the electron. And as a result, we get the electron traveling in this direction, and we get another photon, let's say traveling in this direction, with a longer wavelength than the first photon, because this second photon has less energy than the first. This entire process, the interaction between a photon and an electron, followed by the outgoing electron and photon, is known as Compton scattering. In very simple terms, we can write this as a photon and an electron interacting, and the products of this interaction are a new photon and an electron. Let's keep this in mind while we look at the second of our two processes. This time, we're going to have to consider an electron as well as its antiparticle, the positron. In particle physics, we can describe all particles with a large number of properties, mass, charge, spin, strangeness, charm, and so on. Yes, some of these properties sound very weird, like strangeness, but these are just names that physicists came up with for reasons we'll discuss later as well as in future videos. Now, any two particles with all of the same set of these descriptors are the same kind of particle. Two electrons, for example, will have all of the same values for all of these descriptors. But if we take this particle and flip its charge, so from positive to negative, or from negative to positive, with the same magnitude or size, then we're looking at a new particle that is known as the antiparticle of the first one. There's a bit more subtlety to it than that, but for our purposes, that's all that matters here. Same values of everything except charge. Antiparticles were first predicted by Dirac when he was working on the Dirac equation, and he initially thought that there was something wrong in his maths. But we now know that antiparticles do exist. It's also worth mentioning here that since a photon has zero charge, it is its own antiparticle. Now, this isn't always true for all particles with zero charge because of some other properties, but again, for this video, that's all that matters to us here. Now, we know that when a particle and its antiparticle collide, they annihilate each other, and two photons are released, so that these photon energies add up to the total energies of the particles beforehand. We can write this interaction as electron plus positron results in the creation of two photons. Now, these two processes that we've looked at, Compton scattering and pair annihilation, are seemingly quite different from each other, except for the fact that they deal with similar particles. But if we look at the two processes written in equation form, we might spot something interesting here. Let's start with pair annihilation. We can take any particle and move it to the other side of the equation, but if we do that, we have to put a bar above it to show we're now talking about its antiparticle. So if we take the positron from here and move it to this side while considering its antiparticle, and we then do the same thing with this photon, we come up with a new equation that is also allowed by the rules of particle physics. 
Let's remember that the photon is its own antiparticle and the antiparticle of the positron is the electron, at which point we realize that we've come up with another allowed process that we've already seen to exist, it's Compton scattering. This trick of moving particles to the other side of the equation while switching to their antiparticles in order to find another allowed process is known as crossing symmetry. There's obviously a much more mathematically rigorous explanation to this that we won't go into here. And it's also worth noting that we will only find a new allowed process assuming that the new process still obeys the conservation of mass energy and momentum. For example, if we had some generic particles, W and X, interacting to form some new particles, Y and Z, then we could use crossing symmetry to move X to this side if we consider its antiparticle. Now we're saying that W can decay into anti X, Y, and Z. And in principle, this is okay, but it's only possible if the total mass of the three particles on this side is less than or equal to the mass of W. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough mass or energy for W to split into these three. And finally, let's talk about this concept that antiparticles are particles moving backwards in time. Again, there are more mathematically rigorous explanations of this, but crossing symmetry helps us to visualize it in a fairly simple way. An equation like this indicates how particles interact over time. This side shows the particles we had before, and this side shows the particles we get after. So if we take a particle from the right, the after side, and use crossing symmetry to move it to the left, the before side, remembering that we have to switch to its antiparticle, we can then say that the antiparticle of this original particle can be considered as moving backwards in time relative to the original particle. This works in either direction, by the way, because in this reaction, the original particle was being produced while the antiparticle is doing the producing, and vice versa, of course. We can apply the same logic to any particle on any of these sides being moved to the other side. I don't really know how reasonable and accepted this interpretation is of particles and antiparticles moving backwards in time relative to each other, but it's cool to think about nonetheless. It's this idea that crossing symmetry allows us to go over to the other side, whether that's the before side or after side, as long as we consider the antiparticle, and therefore the antiparticle is kind of like moving in the reverse direction of time, to the actual particle. And with that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit that bell for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch, it's linked in the description below, and it's based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons, as well as all the others over on my Patreon page. That's also linked in the description if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you very soon.